Hey everybody, so welcome to another edition of Reading Fun in the Sun. Today I am on the Ipswich River and just hanging out. I was thinking about maybe sharing some of my lessons learned from my years of working in machine learning. So this is something that, you know, I'm hoping will help you. Um, they're not really focused on code. They're really focused about all the other stuff that goes along with being just a data scientist that is doing some machine learning in the field. So if this sounds interesting to you, keep on watching. All right, so kicking this off, anything that's really focused on, you know, keeping up in the field or advice on code, I have other videos on that and I will link them down below if you want to go and check those out. But jumping in, uh, first is data science in the field is certainly not as glamorous as you might see on TV. Now, that's probably not news to most of you, but the people you work with are not the ones in the trenches with you. So they might actually think that it is as glamorous as, as the TV folks make it out to be. But the 80-20 rule really applies here, which is 20% of the time you're going to be doing the things you love to do, which is you know modeling and putting things out into the world to em empower and embedder people's lives, while the rest of the time you are going to be uh, finding, pleading for, and cleaning data. And you know, I think data practices are getting better and hopefully we get cleaner data sets out there, but most of the time we don't have them. So that is unfortunately most of the job right now. The next is, unless you are really lucky, no one, not even your boss, are really going to know what you actually do. I cannot tell you how many job interviews I've been on where I am teaching the hiring manager what a data scientist is or a machine learning person, what they can do, or what skills or role they actually need for the job that they have because they don't know it themselves. So a lot of time you gotta be your own advocate and you also have to know when to cut your losses because the company you're interviewing with or working for might not actually know how to use your skill sets wisely or appropriately. Kind of in that same vein and that is, uh, there's a lot of different types of data scientists. I'm gonna put something on the screen here that I have found incredibly helpful over the years. I always, always use this as my go-to visual on all the different types of data science skills. If you are a data scientist and you can do all of these equally well, you are that unicorn, right? You can do it all. Most data scientists have some of these skill sets, but they focus more on each of these uh, branches. And that is perfectly appropriate. The thing is, everyone is going to think you're a unicorn or expect you to be a unicorn. So if this visual helps you explain to the people you are working with what you actually do, fabulous. Everybody wants machine learning, but nobody really wants to know what it is. So this is a point of frustration. They don't, the people that you're working with, they don't necessarily need to know all the ins and outs of machine learning, but they do need to understand what is the in the realm of possibility. And in most cases, that's gonna be up to you. And that is what I have learned, is go into things with business partners uh, with an open mind, but you also have to make sure that they understand that you are the authority on what will and will not be possible. And then you have to work together to, to work through that. Um, and do that often. Because the next piece that we're going to talk about is everybody wants good machine learning, but they don't really want to learn what that means. So these last two, definitely make sure that you think about this when you are scoping uh, your projects, but also when you're doing presentations. Uh, because oftentimes when you're talking about if something is good or bad, you have to present this in a way that is going to resonate with your stakeholders and you, you, you wanna go into all the machine learning uh, specialness and detail, but oftentimes that's just lost on them. So you have to find uh, an easier way to communicate with them on those things. And I've often found just showing good examples is is a best way to, to do that. The next is that a lot of people might confuse you with an analyst, or if you are an analyst, maybe people are, are asking you to do things that are more on the machine learning side of the house. Now, analysts have a lot of overlap skills with those in the data science and machine learning space, but you have to be very aware that you're not being taken advantage of 
and that's for either of those two uh, roles, you need to really look at your roles and responsibilities and your salary because your salary can often be confused with a different type of role if you are on the analyst side or if you're the machine learning side. So just keep that in mind as you're going through things because oftentimes they are mixed and used interchangeably, but they're really not. There's some overlap. So related to that last, you really do need to evangelize not only your role, but the benefits of machine learning specific to your organization because there, you know, maybe you have some really uh, innovative people uh, on your team and they're like, oh, I just heard about this new great thing that Google is doing. Great, but maybe you're not Google and <laughs> maybe you don't even have data to supply for that use case. So, you know, you're, you're it's going back to that, that intermediary between the business and what's actually possible. Speaking of what's possible, is even though there are a million amazing and sophisticated ways to do machine learning, you will likely be working with rule-based systems that were developed at least 10 or more years ago. <laughs> this is the uh, dirty truth of many, many organizations that they may be using things that are like machine learning or they even call machine learning, but they are rule-based systems. And th that's not you know, saying that rule-based systems don't have a time and a place, but if you are a new data scientist that is focused on machine learning and you get into an organization and you're like, yay, I'm gonna do all these crazy, fantastic, fancy things, let me tell you, all the big companies, you name it, the big, big companies that you're thinking of, I have talked to most of them and they are all using mostly rule-based systems. <laughs> So just, you know, that doesn't mean they're not developing new and sophisticated things. It just means that oftentimes those are not put into practice quite yet. The next is going back to the stakeholder conversations a little bit where if you are presenting to stakeholders, always, always ask your stakeholders to repeat back what they think you said, <laughs> because oftentimes they have either missed the point or misinterpreted the point that you were trying to make. People that I have worked with, you know, six plus years, I still do this because every machine learning project is unique and different. Even if you're just updating models, it's really helpful to make sure that the business repeats back what they think you're telling them so you can verify it is accurate because there is nothing worse than going into a meeting right after that where they repeat what they think you said and you're like, oh no, that is not what I meant. Next is, even though there are a ton of metrics to show how successful a model is, uh, using the word confidence is a good blanket way to describe what that metric is. So, you know, we've got cluster distance, F-score, co cosine, all of these different things that we can to, to indicate the success of the experiment or the model or the project. But oftentimes what I have found is if you can translate that into how confident they can feel in that model, that that model is predicting whatever you are actually trying to do, that is essentially what you're trying to convey to them is the confidence in that model, even if the model is not looking at a confidence score. So I have found this to be incredibly helpful. Now, you know, it is also good to say there are real metrics behind this, but this is what you need to pay attention to. And I have found that has been incredibly helpful in, in all of my machine learning things that I do. Uh, the other thing that you're going to see is that you're going to use highly supervised models. And that's mostly because a lot of companies are still uh, a little scared of using machine learning um, that is unsupervised. And you know, I, that doesn't mean that unsupervised doesn't have a place either, but you're going to have to build their confidence. And oftentimes that means using even a supervised approach first and then comparing it to how the unsupervised model would perform and throwing the uh, exceptions to whatever rule also at the unsupervised model to see if it can actually handle it. I have found that that's a really good way to help your stakeholders get into the unsupervised realm. There's also the opposite, right? And I, I put this all in the same uh, tip here, which is Sometimes people just want to use only unsupervised models, which again, there's a time and a place for that. But sometimes it's 
because they just want the machine to be magic and they don't want to have any people in the loop at all. I don't want any people at all in this entire thing uh, is, is kind of the thought process on that. And you have to be a little cautious when you hear that because what it means is there's probably some historical context that you're missing and you need to ask about that. But it also means that they might not really understand what an unsupervised model can do and how sometimes you still have to correct it. It's not all automated. It's not this magical box that will do everything that they think it will. Even though there are some, again, amazing ways to do machine learning, always start with the easiest solution and work your way, way out in complexity. And it is so easy for us in data science world to be like, oh, I just saw this really cool thing. I want to go play. I want to go see if it's going to be effective. And, you know, if you have the type of role where you can do experimentation, that is fabulous. You are so lucky. Most of us in the field can't take that liberty. And, you know, it's a bit it's a business decision, too. You know, you need to get the best solution as quickly as possible. So that oftentimes doesn't mean it is the best of the best model. It is what is good enough for the business to move forward with it, because honestly, Machine learning is constantly changing. There's different algorithms and different methods being developed constantly. So if you are always in search of the best of the best, you will never complete it. And also keep in mind your stakeholders are going to lose patience quickly. So always uh, pick wisely when you are going in. I try to stick to like the top three. Um, I try to only pick three models uh, or methods and that's a lot, right? So I try to find the most logical one first, of course, um, that is going to get us the quickest win with the confidence that we are looking for. Notice I said confidence, right? Um, that's the approach that I have found is, is helpful. Not going past three is, is, is giving the business for them to, to grab onto that you're gonna be using. So next is um, most people will call what you do AI, artificial intelligence. And that's mostly just to sound sexy and hip. Now, you might also be calling what you do AI. I have a whole video, I'll link it down below. You know, it's it, it, it adds to that glamorization of, of what we do. And you know, that's fine. There's, there's really uh, good reasons to do that sometimes, but it just makes a lot of people uncomfortable when they see how difficult things are and how the machine really struggles with things. So this really goes back to stakeholder expectation management, because if you say it's artificial intelligence, they might have a very different idea of what it can do compared to what it is in reality. So just be weary of that as, as you go through. If you are doing GraphML, just keep in mind, most people will maybe have graph-like data or they have a few failed graph projects <laughs> they think they know what graph is, but they likely might not have a good grasp of what graph can do and they likely don't have a graph database and a graph pipeline. So if you're doing anything with knowledge graph, just keep in mind that a lot, again, big, big, big companies, they are doing graph-like things, but not in an actual graph database. So um, it, it might be a little uh, tr trial and error uh, when you first get, get into place with, with some of these where they're not actually using graph. And then last but not least is people will think you are either a wizard or a hacker. <laughs> it's the strangest thing. I mean, we are working to, you know, put meals on tables and roof overheads just like anybody else. But for some reason, that that glamorous TV lifestyle of a data scientist is still stuck in a lot of people's heads. So you either own that, right? And that's totally fine if you want to own that. I have uh, seen some people really troll um, <laughs> others, and it's it's pretty funny to, to watch. Um, or you can choose to de-glamorize it so that you can, you know, get a better idea of that um, stakeholder management. Either way, it doesn't matter because what you do is amazing. A lot of people are uh, trying to get into machine learning and data science. And if you already have some of those skills, you are amazing just the way that you are. 
and don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise and don't make anyone make you feel like you're an imposter or that you are maybe too young or too old to know what you're doing in this space because we all come in different shapes and sizes for this space and you know un unfortunately there is um, kind of a stigma in what a data scientist is and just make sure you break that mold because I've also faced a lot of that and I know a lot of friends that have as well so don't feel like you're alone and make sure that you 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 truly feel that confidence that you should have in your skills all right with that those are hopefully some words of wisdom and lessons learned from the machine learning space from my perspective i would love to hear what yours are down below so with that i want to thank you very much and i'll catch you next time